well, the great mystery of human emergence, of course, is language. What is it? Where did it come from? How did it ever get going on such a scale? So forth and so on. But it looks to me like what we're seeing in psilocybin is a kind of neurological enzyme, a catalyst in the environment that could take an evolving primate population and put it through a series of forced changes that produce ultimately a self-reflected, minded uh, creature practicing a shamanic mother goddess religion in this nomadic context. And that was paradise. And that was the ideal for the archaic revival. In other words, that Eden actually existed, that we are made for better things than what we've got. You know, it says in Finnegan's Wake, here in Moikain, Moikain was the red light district of Dublin, here in Moikain we flop on the seamy side, but up Nyent, prospector, you sprout all your worth and woof your wings. That's a promise for the future. Up Nyent, you sprout all your worth and woof your wings. But also, Antes, we sprouted our worth and woofed our wings. And this whole nostalgia for a perfected shamanism in prehistory is reasonable, I think. I mean, I think we had something, an unimaginably precious gift. We had consciousness and dynamic order. Consciousness as we experience it now within the confines of history is most analogous to cancer. I mean, it's just, you know, replicating, spreading, but it once was a dynamic, ordered thing. People lived, they died, they made love, they had children, they herded their flocks, they had ecstatic flights into dimensions which we cannot even conceive of, and they felt no need, you know, to break into the earth, to divert the rivers, to do all of this stuff. And and um, you know, even if we're not aesthetically attracted to that, we have to make a value judgment on it because it was not a runaway process. It did not push everything uh, toward crisis. Okay, well then, so what happened? What the hell happened? If that's how it was, well, you know, nature is just an ongoing story. The very drying processes that created those grasslands, that created those pressures on diet, that created that mother goddess religion, that evolved those ungulate animals, that process continued. And the grasslands dried up, and the winds began to blow, and the water holes got further and further apart from each other, and the mushroom festivals went from every Saturday night to the first... Uh, Saturday of every month, and then to four times a year, and then to once a year, and then to once every five years, and then to never. And in the absence of the psychedelic experience, this ego thing gets going. I mean, it is literally like a calcareous growth in the bloodstream of the psyche. If you don't inoculate yourself against it, it will begin to take root and grow and and the world the the boundaries of the world begin to move inward you know and you no longer see things on a planetary scale or a millennial scale or it's just about you know my women my money my land my children all of this stuff and at that point you get um the appearance of of historical civilizations you have kingship, kingship, you know, the age of Gilgamesh. I mean, my God, when you read the story of Gilgamesh, you just wonder what's going on. Uh, Gilgamesh spurned the goddess, and the goddess sent a bull, which to me is, you know, symbolic of the mystery of the mushroom, the ungulate herding horned animal, the crypto symbol for the goddess. The goddess sends a bull. And he, he uh, rejects the bull. He rejects the goddess. He rejects the bull. Then he takes Enkidu, the shaman figure, and forces him to go with him into the wilderness. And what do they do in the wilderness? This 
oldest of all myths, this story of the first men, what do they do? They cut down the tree of life. That's what they do. They cut down the tree of life. And then they, you know, it goes forward. The earliest strata of mythology that comes out of these Middle Eastern civilizations is full of this male-female nature artificial tension. The story of Genesis is a similar thing. I mean, what's happening in Genesis is history's first drug bust. Uh, a woman is involved with a plant, and the plant uh, opens their eyes, and they see that they are naked, which happens to be the case. They are naked. So in other words, they, they see, they grok their true existential condition. And Yahweh, wandering around mumbling to himself in the garden, says, this thing that these people have done, what if they eat of the fruit of the tree of life? Then they will be as we are. So it's very clear that there is concern to withhold knowledge that hum human beings are to be held in an inferior position. Otherwise, if they were to eat of the fruit of the tree of life, of knowledge, they would be as we are. So there's this whole tension. And in the story in Genesis, you'll recall Adam and Eve are cast out of Eden, and an angel is set at the east of Eden with a burning sword. Well, what I take this to be about is the, it's a story from a strata where already the shift to the dominator culture has taken place. But they're looking backward at the partnership society in, on the grasslands of Africa. And the, and the angel with the burning sword is nothing more than the sun, that they literally were cast out of Eden. Eden disappeared around them. It dried up and blew away. And there was nowhere to go but the Nile Valley and Palestine. And these people who appear in the Nile Valley in Palestine at about 9,800 BC, called Natufayan, come out of nowhere with a very high culture and a tremendous ability at, to exploit plant resources. And I think they are the remnants of this partnership culture. And you see, our, our, the way in which all this ties into the present and tr attempts to be more than just a, uh, you know, a kind of cultural reconstruction of prehistory is we're trying to understand who we are, why we are the way we are. Well, the major thing that now that we have transcended ideology and nobody gives a hoot whether you're a Marxist or any of that anymore because we've all seen through that, the, the new issue is human nature. And it evolves around this drug thing, you know. Is it the true and purest expression of human nature that you should drink nothing but cold water and eat nothing but raw vegetables? And any departure from this is an abomination. And then when you get to drugs, you know, this is really an abomination. How, what should be our relationship? To substances, and why are we the addictive creatures that we are? I mean, I know that elephants intoxicate on papayas and bumblebees get loaded on sugar water and this and that, but human beings addict to dozens of substances, to behaviors. I mean, all kinds of things. A guy goes out in the morning to pick up his paper off his porch, and it's not there, and he has a heart attack. <laughs> You know, he has to flip down. He, my God, you know, what am I going to? And, and he has to have instant relief from the, the traumatic crisis <laughs> of the non presence of the, the morning information fix and, and the phenomenon of falling in love, which doesn't really happen with other animals. I mean, other animals bond, but they don't go bananas in the way that we do on, on this issue. Uh, we're, we're chemically highly cued in a way that a lot of animals around us aren't. So then history, because of this, because of this addictive drive within us, that we have because of this disrupted symbiotic relationship in prehistory, 
See, we're looking for the score, but we can't quite find it. Imperialism doesn't do it. Heroin doesn't do it. Sadomasochism doesn't do it. Nothing quite does it. But we keep trying stuff, cocaine, money, fascism, mercantilism, ideology, all of this stuff. We are very, very restless. And the path of our restless, frantic peregrinations across the intellectual landscape is what we call history. You know, it's our effort to try and get straight, get back to something which we feel we deserve and that we lost and that we don't know quite what it was. Well, meanwhile, in the rainforests, in the Arctic tundra, these little brown people have been keeping the gnosis going, never questioning, never doubting, millennia after millennia, going into these hyperdimensional mind spaces and operating there. While this has been going on, we have been elaborating positivism, scientific philosophy, building atom smashers, so forth and so on. We have created then, out of our infantile cultural style, uh, what Eric Fromm would call a fecal culture of st cultural style, because we just excrete stuff, you know, all kinds of stuff. Uh, they have held this mystery. But they, to my mind, the mistake that has been made is that it's been thought that they understood it, that we now go to the shamans and they will explain to us what the inner skinny is on all this. That isn't it. There's no explaining this. Once you've been there, you know the futility of a notion like understanding the psychedelic experience. It's like understanding the ocean or understanding a planetary ecology. We think that things are to be understood, but some things are simply to be, you know, what's the word, appreciated, imbibed, to be in the darshan of them.